Welcome folks. Thank you all for coming. I know you probably have end of semester itis, <laughs> much like I do, trust me. Um, thank you all for coming. This has been so fantastic. I'm so happy to see another big crowd here. Um, we were, unfortunately, Renya Grand was going to read, but unfortunately she got called away. So I believe we have her books for sale if you're interested. <laughs> She's not coming, so um, maybe at some other point she'll be able to come out and meet us. Um, we're going to start tonight with uh, a good friend of mine and a, a Rosemont alum, uh, Courtney Bambrick. Uh, I just say a few words about Courtney. She is just one of those people that's just, I don't know, she's like sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> she's super awesome. And if you ever have a chance to hang with Courtney, you should definitely take uh, take that opportunity to do that. Um, you like that? Yeah, sure. I'm free for events. <laughs> They're going to call you up and say, yeah, I'm going to just hang out. All right. So, um, Courtney holds an MFA from Rosemont College, our beloved alma mater, and uh, is the poetry editor at Philadelphia Stories. Her work is yes, our beloved, <laughs> our other beloved alma mater. Uh, her work has appeared in Apiary, Certain Circuits, Dirty Napkin, Philadelphia Poets, Schuylkill Valley Journal, and Mad Poets Review. She teaches at Philadelphia University and Holy Family University. Please welcome Courtney Jackson. Carla mentioned the end of semester disease that we're all feeling, and um, it's one of those things where it's sort of like, thank God there are people here because it would have been so sad. <laughs> I still have seven pages, to, you know, but some papers, but um, it's fine now that there are so many people here and feel rejuvenated and so on. Um, so, ten minutes? Is that the stuff? Okay. Um, so I am doing like the bad writer thing where I'm reading something, some new things or recently revised. They are revised. They're not totally new, but they are written by hand. So <laughs> that just shows you where in the process they are. But you can see, like, they have, um, like, this compared to that, and then there's, like, <laughs> this one compared to, like, that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not ridiculous, but... They are pretty new, and I'm not sure how they're going to go. Um, mixed in with some stuff that at this point feels really old news to me, um, and will also seem like old news to JC. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and anybody else who's heard me reading the last year. Um, okay. <clears throat> so uh, I've been taking a lot of public transportation recently, and um, that's where this comes from. And a few of these are untitled, which again, I hate. I, we don't take them. Um, but, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, two pale ladies in sunglasses trading photos back and forth on the bus. A paper envelope yawns, tissue tongue rolls on the first lady's lap. Her hand, her one free hand, reaches to secure the stack when we go over bumps. She gestures, needs both hands to flip the deck. We bump, she reaches with her elbow. Oh, the other one says, oh look, gorgeous, right? Look at that smile. From where I sit, I see only the sheen, reflected glossy pages. I think of Abu Ghraib. Oh, oh look, here's another one. Look at that smile. Though instinct tells me, baby, I am an aunt now, and I will show you the new gummy smile of my niece, the smart practiced wink of her brother. Here, here look, just beautiful. Look at that smile. Um, little note, which was that this, it, you know, happened. But um, as uh, like I'm, you know, I have this whole thing in my head of what's going on. I um, I overhear them finishing up, and uh, before before they, these two women left the bus together, the one said, "How did you get your hair to do that?" And I'm like looking directly at the camera. How did you get your hair to do that? But um, the the other woman, you know, kind of responded, and I didn't hear the response. But it was like glamour shots. Clearly, they're talking about like <laughs> glamour shots. They're showing one another. And it was weird, like, were not two ladies that you would expect to have been glamorized by glamour shots, but, you know, they're there. Um, on the 66 bus, if you're ever in town. Um, okay, so this is a, a newer poem from a cycle I'm working on. Um, 
And I think that it goes into, yeah, <laughs> it goes into the, a couple of other ones. So um, hopefully this makes sense. It's seasonal. <laughs> Rainbow sunshine and rain. Um, my Gabriel came to my chamber, woke me from sleep. I was chosen among women, and mine was a sacred womb. He came to me and broke down the door, found me blinking at 1.37 a.m. My Gabriel told me everything would be different now that I carried more than myself. I, in an instant, I was multiplied. Um, so the character that I'm writing about is called Rape Baby, who's not an actual baby, but the concept of rape and the way you carry it with you. Um, <clears throat> one year for Christmas, my Rape Baby gave me a necklace made of macaroni. I wore it everywhere until the yarn frayed sometime after summer. I kept the noodles in a jar on my dresser. For a birthday, she gave me a pair of earrings that she bought with her allowance. I lost one of them, but hung the other on fishing line from the rearview mirror. On Mother's Day, she pulled up all the dandelions from our yard and made a crown for me to wear. I wore it for about an hour, took it off when she was distracted. One night she comes down for dinner and asks where my crown, where was my crown of dandelions? In a Ziploc bag, I tell her, in the freezer. Though I didn't wear it, I couldn't throw it away. She stomps and cries, tells me I don't love her because I won't wear her gifts. I cry too because I feel so badly. I restring my macaroni, put in the single earring, and return the dandelion crown to my head. When I took her to the priest, hoping to douse her with something cool and holy, she went rigid in my arms. Silence. Her body hotted up like the coils on an electric stove. I held her near the font, the cloth of my dress on fire, the skin seared from the inside of my arms, from the shoulder over which she gazed at my family. The oil sizzled on her head. The water steamed. The priest kept it up, pretending not to notice the way my baby changed color before him. God and all assembled. Now red, now green, now purple. The smell of burning wool and cooking meat. I held her still until she slept, damp, mottled, unloved. Even though I never switched my address, uh, even though I never stitched my address into the collar of her coat, she found her way home every time. Even when I walked her into the middle of the zoo and said, wait here, next to the reptile house. Even when I sat her down in church with the otherly dozens, pinching her round cheeks and remarking on her softness and prettiness, and I said that I just had to run to the car and would they mind just for a moment. Even when I took two trains and a plane into another city, into another country, and handed her off to my saddle lover who held her gently, as if she were a doll made of fraying cloth, and I flew home without her. Even though I only buy her one-way tickets, I always overpack her bags. I never taught her the magical numbers of our address or phone number. I was not prepared for my rape baby's appetite. The small mouth had been fed rejection and still had room for seconds. I became a banquet. She took every part of me as sustenance. I was a carvery carcass. When I went cold, she made sandwiches of me on white bread with cranberry sauce and mayonnaise. She feasted until she grew full and tired. Then she slept, and I slept when she slept because there was no other time for sleeping. Soon bones were all I had for her, so she filled a pot and boiled me up with onion and carrot and celery. I bubbled while she stirred. The bones she left to dry on the windowsill. And when they were brittle, she broke them and crushed them with a mortar and pestle. The powder she mixed with flour and baked a loaf of bread for every day that she remembered, which was most days. On the days that she forgot, she starved and was quiet about it. She wondered at the ache in her belly, and I wondered at the fullness of mine. Um, so two more, and these are these come from the the new <laughs> new pieces. Um, Public transportation, here we are again, no title, apologies. Um, the train is not there. Tracks stretch in both directions, legs, legs in splits, arms embracing the sky or ground. The train is not there. Tracks run into a pigeon gray distance. I check the time. Lights should blink and bells should ding, ding, ding at the crossing. But in that pregnant vista, just air. And even though we wait, maybe minutes, only minutes, the train is not there. We think maybe today, for reasons only God and train operators know, maybe today the 746 won't come. We'll stand here, 
in scarves and hoods, in the midst of our own exhalations forever. The man to my left in his headphones singing loud for my benefit forever. Maybe heaven isn't stasis in a cloud or the opening credits of the sound of music, but a train station outbound at 744 between poles of fog. And um, it, this comes from a, uh, obviously, uh, but from a workshop that uh, we do at the East Falls Library. Hey? Um, <laughs> if you want to take up Carla and hang out with me, uh, fourth Wednesday is at East Falls, although next Wednesday is when they won't um, I'll send you something, you'll send it to the book. Um, <clears throat> so that's what this is. Uh, I don't remember what the prompt was, but I create mounds of dough and soups. I create pillowcases, curtains. I create warmth when the temperature outside dips. I create space. I eliminate, I obliviate, I enunciate. But here is the moment I made. This. 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 Have this one. And this. I have plenty of resources. Here is your time. This is our time. It is all we make. It is all we have. Take it. Eventually, we'll make more. Mm -hmm. And that is my <laughs>